the Curcio circles long enough, you hear this Lewis Bird, Lewis Town, back and forth. Then there's the beautiful Buchanan Valley and the sunny scenic Sealand Grove, which I think the beautiful Buchanan Valley came first. Is that Ginny? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, I think the sunny scenic is just trying to outdo the Buchanan <laughs> And uh, Carmen, every time you say you went to the 340th, I feel like, I don't know, we're just like such babe chicks. <laughs> well, it was in 1979. Wow. Okay. Oh. So they're up you to about 800 now. <laughs> wow. 800. How many do they do a year? Uh, they do one almost every month. Oh, in wow. Brooklyn. Fascinating. Wow. Okay. So, how much time do I have left? <laughs> so, 11, when's, when's mass? 11.30. So, I have until 11.30. Wow. You have till 10 after 11. <laughs> Close the blinds here? Uh, you don't want to see me as well, is that? <laughs> yes. We're not trying to embarrass you, but at 11 o'clock, a few of us are going to go to get ready to set up for mass. Oh, we'll be done by 11. Yeah. No, I'm, I've got, I'm supposed to do 30 minutes, so. All right. So uh, in chapters 6 and 7 of Rediscovering Catholicism, uh, those of you who heard my first talk on this, um, you know that I, 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 I don't want to sound like a critic. I was just trying to point out things about Matthew Kelly's style that I usually am aware of. Like he's, he uses a lot of enthusiasm, sometimes hyperbole. He might overstate something. Uh, and... You know, that, you know, from the beginning of the book, you see that. But in this part of the book, you know, I really have all the uh, praise about it. Uh, I, there's plenty of good things to say, of course, about the book in general. But I, I really enjoyed these two chapters. And I was like, yes, and yes, and yes, you know. So uh, no, no criticism of Matthew Kelly today. And I apologize to anybody who found that problematic. But I just wanted to point out how astute we should be when, even when we're reading it books on spirituality that you know we we have to realize that you know we have to evaluate what we're reading as well as what we're what, what we're taking in so I'm going to steal something out of the page of Father Raj's book today so I any uh, whenever you see me going through the sign of the cross uh, uh, method here uh, that is all credit to Father Raja who has revolutionized the thinking of the men of the 101st uh, men's Curcio. So he begins the book here about uh, legitimate needs, deepest desires, and unique talents. What are our real needs that we have in our lives? That's, that's not subject necessarily to our feelings. That's, that's something we evaluate. So father, creator, mind, legitimate needs. What are my legitimate needs? What are my deepest desires in my heart? The son of God. Son of God, deepest desires, the passion, and then my unique talents, the Holy Spirit. How do I live out in the power of the Holy Spirit the things of my life, the, the good deeds that God would have me do? So these three things, he says, must be in harmony in order to become the best version of ourselves. And this is the theme throughout the book, right? How do we be, he's kind of getting to this point, right, of being an authentic Christian and living an authentic life. And he really captures it here in bringing those things together. And I love uh, the statement on page 65, from an infinite number of possibilities, right? There, there are an infinite number of possibilities for us. We talked about this uh, on the Curcio too, right? Uh, how does God see time? And how, how does he, you know, take into account the things, uh, the sequence of events, if there are an infinite number of possibilities. For him, it's easy. He already knows the infinite number of possibilities, and he's already accounted for every one of them. And so saying yes to God, sometimes people say, oh, that's putting a limitation on all these fun and wonderful and enjoyable things I want to do. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, on a later page, too. But saying yes to God is saying yes to your authentic self. And saying no to God is to be something other than God intended you to be. And you're going to see this contrast of yes and no in these, in these chapters, uh, especially when we get to the second chapter, which is about 
uh, the path well trodden. Who trod that path? And we'll talk about that too. So, any, uh, so what are some of the elements of this authentic life? He talks about any honest human activity. Any honest human activity is uh, legitimate uh, content for an authentic life. I think sometimes even among all of the honest human activity that we can choose from, we think, okay, between this good thing and this good thing, which good thing does God want me to do? And I've probably talked about this sometime with some of you, right? God's saying they're both good, and I'm going to be with you wherever you are, because they're all honest, human, good, virtuous choices. And I think sometimes we, we feel like God's on one side of the good uh, or the other side of the good. But you, you just have to make a choice. He's like, you know, I've given you free will. And whatever you choose, you can know that I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to continue to give you the grace you need in that part of your life. Two, two good jobs. You know, uh, but if the choice is between honest work and dishonest work, you know where God stands. And in order to know that more perfectly, you need to, of course, be doing things like this, where you inform your conscience, you inform uh, your knowledge of God, so that you can love him more and cooperate more with his, uh, his intentions for your authentic life. And on page 67, uh, another big yes for me, uh, because I, I've done this in my life, and I'm thinking, you know, it's always funny, right? You know, when, some, when somebody says something in a book or, or, you know, the Pope will say something that I said in a homily, I'm like, oh, right, he agrees with me, you know? <laughs> but it's more like I agree with them. They were probably the ones to come up with it first, and I just happen to trip over it sometime later in my life. So he says that the role of work is two things. It's, um, it's virtue and, your, and supplying your needs. But the virtue is first. And... You know, this, this can be revolutionary for us. When we go to work, why do we go to work? Is it simply to provide for our physical needs? To buy time for, or to get the money to, to, to buy the vacation packages or to, to get, you know, the things around our house or whatever it is. You know, what is the goal of going to work? He says, no, the first um, purpose of your work is virtue to grow in virtue in your workplace, wherever you put your, whatever you put your hand to. So the role of work is first virtue, and second to meet your earthly needs. Such a good teaching. And then he quotes uh, uh, Thoreau. Is it Henry David Thoreau? Is that how it goes? Henry David Thoreau, right? Um, that most men lead lives of quiet desperation. And uh, I, you know, just speaking up for myself, I've been in moments of quiet desperation in my life, either before I knew Christ or after I knew Christ. This is not something that can be unique to uh, somebody who does not have a living, loving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so as Christians, we need to be aware that there could be moments of quiet desperation in our lives and why is that? It's because we're probably, likely, not living out the authentic life. And we're going to work because we just want the things. And we gotta provide, or maybe we don't want them. Maybe it's just, it's, it's like, oh, I gotta provide my, for my family, and there's a fear. And we're doing it out of fear. We, got, we gotta have this job. But when, it, when we enter it first from the perspective of virtue and the authentic life, our lives tend away from quiet desperation to meaning and fulfillment. And so in this authentic life, holiness is the goal. And he uses this illustration of, of, um, of holiness where he says, you, it's basically what drives you towards the end. It's the same one that St. Paul uses, right, when you're running the race, you have to keep your eyes on the goal. And the goal for the Christian life is holiness. If we take holiness out of the end zone or out off the finish line, then we are going to, we are going to disrupt 
the authentic, our pursuit for the authentic life. And so we have to keep holiness as the goal, and we have to continue, again, back to that study, we have to inform ourselves of what leads to true holiness, otherwise we're, we're not going to be able to squarely stand in that end zone and spike the ball at the end of, at the end of time, right? You know? So the authentic life then orients us towards holiness and our essential purpose. And we always have to remember that it is God who works the holiness in us. We are cooperators, we are participants, and it's all his work. We're kind of just trying to get out of the way, say, make me an instrument, and work your holiness in and through me. Very Curcio-like, right? You're hearing a lot of the elements of Curcio right here in Matthew. I wonder if he's a Curcioista. Do you know that? I do not know that. That'd be, that'd be an interesting question. We should invite him to look at Curcio. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to sponsor Matthew Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Um, and, and that can only happen if we assent to it. We say, yeah, God worked through me in this moment. And that's a moment, it could be a moment by moment thing. Usually we're breezing by because of habit, right? Habit works well for us. It makes our lives easier, and that's good. We want habit. And what is a virtue? Does anybody know the definition of virtue? Automatically doing the right thing without even thinking about it. Exactly. That's, uh, and I would say that, so just to repeat it, automatically doing the right thing without thinking about it. A virtue is a good habit. That's what it is. And so if you have good habits uh, for your spiritual life, then they become part of what you do on a regular basis, and you can go fo focus on the next virtue. Uh, remember the shelf? I always talk about you got to pull those virtues off the shelf like you would pull a book or a gift off the shelf to make it benefit you. So uh, Another really good uh, section here on page 70. We change. But God's call to holiness does not. God's call to holiness will never change. The human race continues to develop and change. You and I develop and change in our own lives. But like the North Star, the goal of holiness, the call to holiness by God in the human life never changes. That will always be the guiding principle of the Christian life. So we have... And you know, we always struggle then with distorted images of holiness in our world. Um, but, and, and we have to continue to be the examples of people who say, no, holiness is always um, applicable to any state in life, and it can bring joy and happiness rather than you know, uh, rigidity and you know, sour puss faces because you know, we're being, we, we gotta follow this thing, we gotta do it this way. You know, that's what people think holiness is. They think holiness is running away to the mountains and uh, you know, praying before the Blessed Sacrament every day and it's really boring. Um, holiness is happening right here. Holiness is happening when you're with your family. Holiness is happening when you're in your workplace. Holiness is happening in the bar with your friends. It, can, it, it happens everywhere, but it depends on you being open and assenting to the work of God's holiness at every moment along the way. So holiness is enjoyable. It does not have to stifle happiness, and Curcio is proof of that. Curcio is proof of holy fun. I'll always quote Charles Billet if you're out there listening, holy fun. Are we going to have holy fun today? <laughs> Holy fun is getting home from Curcio, standing in the elevator with your sponsor, and not without saying a word, just hugging each other and jumping up and down. <laughs> That's that is Holy Fun. Holy Fun is you know just being with your family and and, and playing a game. Uh, God's name may not even come up the whole time, but you've 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 spent valuable quality time as you should as parents uh, or as family together. So, Curcio being proof of that, we know that holiness requires an act of the will. I remember one part of, I think it's, I uh, can't remember which Royo it is, it's early on in the, in the Royos, 
Uh, and I don't know if it's from the book or, uh, or if it's just from uh, whoever gave the rodeo. But it, um, no, it was from the Stations of the Cross. Stations of the Cross meditation that we do. I think the very first person, Joe, you were reading, says it cost him his life. That's right. To do what he did to live an authentic life basically cost him his life. It cost us our will. We don't have to die. We don't have to shed the blood. But we do have, it's going to cost our will. It's a very powerful statement in that meditation. It stuck with me ever since I heard it there. And only when you read it, Joe, because I've heard it before. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so there is, for us, for we who know the, this authenticity, holiness um, is, um, it's attractive, right? And that's what he says in the book. It attracts us. It inspires us. And, but that requires our eyes being open to it. There are people who can see holy things being done every day and not even be attracted to it. They don't realize it. Um, because I think they're seeing, you know, if you're kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament, they're going to see that act of holiness. They don't, they don't get it. They might think, oh, that's really peaceful and nice. Maybe it's attractive to them or not, but they're too, they're, their understanding of what is good, uh, true, and noble is distorted because of the, the fallen human nature. But once, once you enter that authentic life and your eyes are, are open to the knowledge of, of Christ and what he can do through you, then you just want it more and you want it more and you want it more. That doesn't mean the battle for the other things that you want that you shouldn't want doesn't continue. But you now have a taste of the authentic life and you don't want to let it go. And so that's what the Curcio method tries to do is to keep that authenticity, that desire for authenticity, growing. And so he, um, so he says, as a conclusion to this, and uh, he quotes Saint, um, I think it's Ignatius, he, uh, he says, the glory of God is the perfection of the creature. That's the glory of God. Your perfection is God's glory. He is glorified in and through you every time you um, exhibit the authentic life. And wherever you are, whether somebody sees you or not. And he brings us then to this, the, um, the discipline of striving for virtue. And it's so important uh, in our lives that we realize that this is, is discipline. We'll get, I think we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that's a little foretaste of what's coming. So on page 75, he reminds us of what God's will is. And God's will in 1 Thessalonians is very clearly stated. It seems very generic and very general because you're going to think, oh, I'm going to go to that passage and I'm going to read and I'm going to find out what God wants for me. And it's going to be very specific. Well, it kind of is, but it's kind of general. He wants you to be saints. He wants to be the saints he called you to be. Uh, and I'm always um, bickering about whether we can call ourselves saints or not. I'm going to assume you're all saints in this room. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the benefit of the doubt that you're living the authentic life. That you have, uh, you have, that you've entered the state of grace and you're remaining in the state of grace. That you are not willfully committing any moral sins and therefore you are hagias in the Greek. Hagios, meaning holy ones. You'll see that in the, the lectionary translation of the scriptures. But in other translations, you might see the word saints. Paul calls you saints if you are living the authentic life. I always, just, I always compare that to being capital S, saints. You're not canonized saints yet. So don't get ahead of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what the Second Vatican Council calls us to. Second Vatican Council calls us to, um, in its key documents, uh, not, any, not any particular grand changes in spirituality for the church, although many have used it to justify aberrations in spiritual practice. The Second Vatican Council called us to authentic holiness, which is the universal call to holiness, poverty, chastity, and obedience. 
We need to know what those are. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. Those are the, the evangelical counsels, which means that they are the gospel counsels. That means if we live our lives according to those three things, the gospel will be proclaimed. And you're thinking, well, Father Roger, he's got, he should be the poverty guy, right? He's, he's a priest. He's you know, taking care of the orphans and... You know, he does his thing, but I'm married and I have kids. I can't take a vow of poverty or, you know, make any promises to that. But you can. How many kids? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> but in every aspect of your material goods, you can assess, am I, am I meeting my legitimate needs? I think we, we make a big mistake in saying, that the things we deeply desire, which we know can be distorted, our desires can be distorted for the, for the bigger car or the better car or the bigger television or the, you know, um, the Blender Pro 3065, you know, we, we think, oh, we need those things. No, legitimate needs. If we as Christians, even those who are called to, uh, this, the holy, to holy matrimony and to raising families and children, we live within our legitimate needs. That's what it means to live the evangelical um, council of poverty as a married person. And then anything that goes beyond that, your legitimate needs, is open and available to what God would have you do with it. Uh, we talk about tithing, uh, which really means a tenth, but we, we kind of fudge it either way now. Now, as Christians, we don't say you have to give a tenth, but that would be a, a good start. But maybe for your family, 5% is a good start. But you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start evaluating. Do, what, you know, when I make my decisions and I'm living my authentic life, how do I live the evangelical counsel of poverty? I just, um, uh, not too long ago, I had uh, a conversation with a man who does like millions of dollars in business every year. I'm like, I would have no idea that he makes as much money as he makes because he doesn't live that way. He and his family live very simply uh, in a simple home, and you would think, well, why don't you buy a bigger house? You know, you've got more kids than half the people, uh, you know, that I know, so you should build more rooms. No, they can share rooms. They'll be fine. You know. So that's the Evangelical Council of Poverty. Chastity. <coughs> Chastity is um, living um, chastely in your state of life. So um, Father takes a vow of celibacy. Uh, I will be celibate if my wife were to precede me in death, but I am also chaste in my marriage. You should be chaste in your marriages if you're called to marriage. If you are not in a marriage, then you live chastely and you reserve your sexual activity for holy matrimony, for unity and procreation. And we keep the sacredness of that act, which is, um, is open to life and, and for the good of the spouses in its proper context. And we always reverence the things that surround it as well, because it is very, very good. God declared it to be good even if we have distorted it and tried, uh, as a society, to make it something consumable and something less than it ought to be. And obedience. Obedience um, to those that you are subject to in your workplace, to do the best that you can for them. Obedience uh, to the uh, bishop and, and the priests, uh, your pastors. Obedience to the magisterium and the teachings of the church. Obedience to lawful authority. Um, and authority exercised within uh, moral, within the moral realm. Of course, disobeying an, an evil law is something that you may have to do someday because you are subject to the higher law of God. But obedience, nonetheless. Legitimate needs, poverty, chastity, the deepest desires, and obedience in you know, how we live our lives in our unique talents and bringing harmony to those three. You cannot find happiness then without finding your essential purpose. And you won't possess it unless you have self-mastery. 
brought this up at the beginning of the book. Uh, he doesn't use the term self-mastery, but he, does, he goes in this next section into talking about discipline. We, as Christians, reading the scriptures, we know that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And we need to pursue self-control. That's, that's a great practice of Lent, is to help us find self-control. But we should practice that all year round. Self-mastery. He goes into the next chapter on the path well trod to talk about the saints because they, they ran the race before us. They, 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 we have a well-beaten path. And so we look to the saints and he talks about what's authentic about the saints. And he tries to correct the vision of saints uh, that, that uh, as if they're always perfect or they're in those pictures that make them look oh so holy. And then we know that the, if we really get into their lives, we know that they were great sinners like us. And that they, they, also had, they also had struggles, and they also needed to be saved from sin, just like anybody else needed to be saved from sin. And so he's trying to keep our picture and our practice with the saints in its proper context. And I love what he says when, when he states that um, veneration of the saints should never be more important than imitation. If veneration becomes more important than imitation, then it leads to superstition. So your imitation of the saints must be greater than any veneration you, you have for them, lest you slip, perhaps, into superstition. And he's, he talks about how he was an athlete. In, I, I don't know how he had any time to do anything else, the number of sports he listed that he did. But his father would have him study the champions of the sports that he was, he was playing so that he could learn how to play better. And so that's what we do. The saints are champions of faith, and we want to imitate them. Uh, Father Raja reminded us um, that you can be saved in an instant, in a, in a minute. The thief on the cross, saved in a moment. And yet it takes a lifetime of holiness, right, to, to pursue holiness. And from the moment that the thief was told that you will be with me today in paradise, he still had to maintain that destination of holiness. That conversion that he had in those moments, however few left he had, the rest of his lifetime should, could have, or should have, I should say, been oriented still to the man, the God-man who was being um, crucified next to him. And then he would be with him in paradise. So whether it's a few minutes or a hundred years, it, holiness is for a lifetime. There's a paragraph, a specific one that I want to read from here. Page 83. Page 83, Matthew, um, Matthew says... It is therefore not uncommon for modern Catholics to judge Sunday Mass, the Church, and Catholicism by what they get out of it. This attitude is the fruit of individualism. What do I get out of Mass? I don't get anything out of it, so I don't go. That's individualism. That's a prevailing philosophy that we need to battle in our day. Similarly, most modern Catholics have abandoned almost every Catholic tradition that is not self-gratifying or that requires any exercise of discipline. This attitude is the fruit of hedonism, another prevalent philosophy contradictory to our faith. Hedonism manifests in the church by abandoning almost every Catholic tradition that requires discipline. It is also very common for people to think, I go to church on Sunday and I always say grace before meals. Isn't that enough? This attitude is the fruit of minimalism. What's the least I need to do in order to get the gain? Another prevailing philosophy that is contrary to our faith. Very good. That's a very good paragraph. I love that paragraph. Individualism, hedonism, 
minimalism. And now, I'm looking at those three things and I'm saying, where are these things in my life? Because I'm sure they're still there. At least sometimes when I go to work. <laughs> What's the least I have to do today? Oh, gee, I hope my boss is in the Christian <laughs> Um <laughs> So let's talk about discipline for a minute here. Um, got a few minutes left. So let's go back to the yes and no. Saying yes to the authentic life really means saying no to so many other things. And our, our world is contradictory on this, right? They, they want to praise the artist who, you know, spent hours perfecting their, and they, they admire the work and the mural or the sculpture and they're like, this is because he was so disciplined. Oh, wow, that's great. But then when it comes to the Christian living the authentic life, oh, what a boring, limited existence you must live. You see the, you see the fallacy there? You see the contradiction? That, uh, that they're self-contradictory? Oh, the musician, oh, that's so beautiful. I'm, they're so thankful and they, they look so light and they, they, they take joy in what they do. Look how beautiful it is. And, uh, but the Christian, that life, look how miserable that must be. You know, you know, that chastity thing, so limiting, so, so boring and not fun. That obedience thing, I don't want to be obedient to anybody. Um, but they're yes to those disciplines makes them authentically the artists and the musicians that they are. And it brings greatness in their art. The more disciplined they are to the virtue of their art, the more beauty can come from it. The more disciplined we are to the art of holiness, and whose art it is, is it? It's God. We're just saying, God, make me your canvas. So how much easier it can be? Write on me, draw on me, paint on me, sculpt me, chisel me. It hurts, it's sloppy sometimes, it bothers me, it gets in my face, in my eyes, in my heart, it hurts. But what greatness and beauty can come from it because of discipline. Without discipline, without authenticity, we will simply live lives of quiet desperation. If you master the discipline, then your individual style of holiness, believe it or not, there are individual styles of holiness, and the genius of holiness in you will manifest in a unique way. As Picasso studied the boring, perhaps, art of his day to some, it wasn't until he mastered the fundamentals that Picasso became the unique an accomplished artist he was that created a whole new genre of, of painting. So first, in discipline, master the fundamentals so that greater uniqueness of God's infinity can be seen and expressed through you. Jesus was very disciplined and they hated him for it. And he will hate you for your discipline as well. But you must continue to follow that North Star of holiness. Saying yes means to one thing, means exclusion from so many other things. Saying yes to being here today excluded you so, from so many other things that could have been fun and wonderful and exciting that the world wants you to see. But your yes to be here today is your commitment to the art of holiness, the greatness that God has for you in your authentic life, and a unique and new expression of genius and style that the world has yet to see. Thank you, Morris. Thank you very much, Deacon. <laughs> it all comes together. Um, let's take a little break. Uh, if you need to go out in the hallway, we all know where the restrooms are. Uh, there's uh, water and coffee back there, but we will be having mass at 11:30. Are we having our next talk? You're still on. Okay. And our next talk.